Uh, those of you that are joining us from home, thank you. There is a handout. It's a yellow sheet of paper, half sheet, things on both sides. And if you didn't get one, are there any of those left, Matt? Two. Two left. So if you want one of those. Um, there's a, a single Sony earbud that was found outside. If you are missing your earbud and it belongs to you, let me know. Uh, I don't want it. One of them doesn't help me. Um, and then I had another question. I know my dad does. Do any of you have experience with um, puppets? No puppets. Okay. Experience with puppets. Puppet hand stages. Puppets yeah, and yeah uh, hand puppets. Right, not marionettes. Do you have experience with hand puppets, Roger? I'm hoping. You interested in uh, refreshing your hand puppeting skills? Of course. What's that for? We had a, we had a um, family, uh, Beverly's son, Ron, did puppets for a long time, but he's not able to do them anymore, so they donated uh, a nice puppet stage and sets of puppets and scripts to the church. That's great. I need someone to make that happen. All right, 2 Peter chapter 1. Let's start there tonight. 2 Peter chapter 1. I was considering the puppets for our vacation Bible school program, which will be June 20th to the 24th. That's what uh, I was thinking about specifically. 2 Peter. There is a ladies thing tonight. Ladies, if you'd like to join them, they're in the ministry room. I believe they have two, maybe three weeks left, and then they'll finish that up, their book that they're working on. Then we're all going to be in here for five, six, seven, maybe eight weeks while we go through a study on prayer again, and then the ladies will have another class. So if you would like to join the ladies, they're in the ministry room. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 12. Wherefore, Peter says to uh, the folks to whom he's writing, he says, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it is meet, I think it meet, or appropriate, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. What word do you see come up there three times? Remembrance. Remember. He says, you know these things, you're even established in them, but I want to remind you of them again. So that's what we're doing tonight. We're taking a test. That little half sheet that you received on your way in, or Matt had a two at one point, um, that's a little test. But this is an open book test. So what we're going to do, and you'll see each of these points. This is my copy. It's just white, but same as your copy. We're going to look at the verses that are listed there. And we're going to talk again about the Elmira heartbeat. Every church has different emphases. Some churches have a lot of programs for children. Some churches feed the homeless. Some, people, some churches even provide a uh, shelter for homeless people. Some churches do a great job of missions. Every church is different, and our church has its emphases, and we're going to go over those again tonight. Now, you'll remember, this is where remembrance comes, and you'll remember last spring, last summer, it took about 10 weeks in the evening. There was some things in between, but about 10 weeks in the evening to go over these points. So none of this is going to be totally new to you, but it's good to remember these things, and they're important to me, and I want them to be important to you. How many of you have ever had someone ask you a question like, well, what's different about your church, or what's special about your church, or what is it that your church does? Anyone ever have someone yeah. asking that question? Yeah. These are some of the things I think would be appropriate. Here, here's what my church emphasizes, and uh, we'll go over these things tonight. Let's pray, and um, then we'll get started. Father, thank you for the folks that you've brought today. Thank you for giving us your word to remind us of truth and to teach us truth. Open our minds to the lesson that's here tonight. Cause us to think clearly, take away the deception, the, the veil that prevents us from seeing your truth clearly. 
And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to look up these verses. Let's start in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40. And then I'm going to ask you a second question in addition to what the blanks are. You're going to help me with those. I'm going to ask you, how do we live these principles out? How? What does that look like? What is, there, what is the evidence that we are living these principles out look like? Again, there is a ladies' class tonight. They're meeting in the ministry room. If you'd like to join them, you're welcome to be here, ladies. I'm just letting you know. They're going to finish up that book over the next two to three weeks, and then we'll all be in here. Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40. And I'm going to ask you guys to do some of the reading tonight. So, Marcos, did you find that? Yes, did you read that to us, Matthew uh, 22, 37 to 40? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love the Lord, love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Great. So we see we have uh, love, number one, love, number two, and love, number three. The first two answers are found in that passage. What are the two things we are to love? God. God. So I'm going to actually write in my copy here, just like you're going to write in your copy. We're going to love God. Oops, come on, we can do this. Oh, there it is. We're going to love God, and we're going to love, I'm going to put people. Because we know from Jesus teaching about the Good Samaritan that our neighbor could be someone who is culturally different than us. Mm -hmm. Could be someone that our culture despises. So I'm just going to put people there. Love God, love people. Um, there's some other verses in there. We're going to skip down to Psalm 119.97. Psalm 119.97. Psalm 119.97. Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. That's Psalm 119.97. So what is the third thing we're going to love? Yeah, God's law, God's word. So we're going to love God, we're going to love people, and we're going to love God's word. Now let's talk about what that looks like. I, and I have things in mind, but I'm open to, to what truth God has taught you. If I say I love God, what is going to be a primary evidence that I love God, that other people could look at and see? Roger. Oh. Yeah, if we love God, we'll love our brethren. So if I say, I love God and I hate my brother, First John tells us, you don't love God. Mm -hmm. Excellent, Roger. That's exactly the type of thing I'm thinking about. What are some other evidences that I love God? Kurt? We go to church uh, regularly. Yeah, I think we'd want to be in God's house worshiping him. My dad and I have both talked to a neighbor of mine. He's a couple houses from me, but uh, he says, I love God, but I don't go to church. <laughs> okay? Uh, why? I mean, well... It's the people. So, well, it's pretty hard to go to church without people. So, yeah. uh, church is people. Um, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna want to be in God's house worshiping Him. And if you know, if we're the church we're at isn't right doctrinally wrong, we're gonna move away from that church. We're gonna find a church where we can worship with other people. That, excellent. Anything else? Yes, Patty. The fruit of the spirit. Yeah, we should see in our lives. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, temperance. David, you had something. No, I agree. Yeah, yes, I agree with you. Uh, explain, expound, say a little bit more. Well, be careful how you talk. I mean, you know, one, well, like, there would be profanity. Right. Gossip is very important. We right. talk about other people. Right. You know, and of course, you don't, I mean... You don't go to a club, you don't you might want to go to preach your own Bible there because you don't care about other people off. But there is ways that you can talk to people mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Good example. Um, it's going to be seen in our language. Marcos. I, um, I mentioned it to you a few weeks ago to hate evil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to love God is to hate evil. There, right. There's a verse, I'm trying to remember where it's found, that says that. Mm -hmm. um, let's turn that to the positive side, though. That's true. The positive would be, if we love God, what will we do? Yes, ma'am. We'll obey. We'll obey, right? If you love me, 
Keep my commandments, Jesus says in John 14. And we're told that if we love God, we will keep his commandments, and his commandments won't be grievous to us in 1 John 5, 3. So we'll keep his commandments. So if you're doing something that the Bible says don't do, right? Let's imagine you are a bank robber, and then I come to prison to visit you, and you say, well, I love God, and that's why I was robbing banks. No. No. It doesn't work that way. If you love God, you're going to keep his commandments. Good. If we love people, how is that going to be seen? Yes, AJ. The way we treat them. Yes. Yes, a person who is nice to you and mean to the waitress is not a nice person. <laughs> right? Uh, and so we're going to treat people as if they are created, not as if they are, they're created in the image of God. Mm -hmm. And even if they irritate us, even if they're mean to us, in fact, the Bible says we ought to love our enemies and pray for those who despitefully use us. So if we love people, it's going to be seen in how we, how we treat them. Good. I'm going to keep it moving. We're going to try to get through half of this today. One, two, three, and four. And then we'll do five, six, seven, and eight uh, next week. Um, if we love God's word, how is that going to be revealed? What's going to be the evidence for that? We love God's word. Yes, Roger. Yeah, I'm going to read it. You're going to spend time in it. You're going to know it. You're going to, you're going to enjoy talking about it. Do any of you have someone at work that, that is a, I mean, a huge fan of one of the local sports teams, mm -hmm. the Warriors, or the 49ers, or the A's, or uh, who else did, plays around, the Giants? What do they talk about a lot? That, their favorite team, who they traded, or who they signed, or how many points they made, or their record. I mean, they just, that's what they like to talk about. If, if they are a 49ers fan, I'm sure that they, are, think that the Bengals lost the Super Bowl because the referees are poor referees. Okay. Terrible call lose, terrible calls, gave the game away. And that's not what they talk about. Why do they talk about that? That's what's on their, that's what they love. That's what's on their mind. So if I say I love God's law, where should my mind be? My heart be? I ought to, I ought to talk about it. And that's one of the things David just brought out. I mean, even, it's not so much that I'm trying to preach this message tomorrow at work as much as at some point tomorrow at work, one of these topics is probably likely to come up, right? The, your, your co-worker says, you know that guy, I hate him. He is so mean. And you say, well, the Bible says we ought to love our enemies and pray for them. He's going to think you're crazy. But it's going to come out because that's what's on your heart. That's what's on your mind when we meditate. On God's law, it rattles around in our head. And then when we're talking with people, that's what comes out. So, okay, that's that's the first one. We're going to love God. We're going to love people. And we're going to love God's word. Let's go to Isaiah 57, 15 for our next, uh, again, this is an open book test. For our next answer, we're going to go to Isaiah 57, 15. And we'll probably look at all four of these, so. Isaiah 57, 15. Again, I'm going to ask you to read because I don't want to read all these passages myself. Uh, Dad, Steve, would you read Isaiah 57, 15? Uh, for thus saith the high and lofty, one that uh, inhabit eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, but him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Thank you. You can probably guess the answer from that verse alone, but let's go ahead and go to Matthew 5, 3. This is the first beatitude. Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Anyone want to take a guess at what the blank is? We can go on to the next verse, too. We're going to look at the other two anyway. So. Uh, yes, humility. A deep, sincere humility before... Oops, I can do this. A deep and sincere humility before an infinite and holy God. Let's look at the other two verses, because the next question I'm going to ask you will be, how is that revealed in our lives? How do we see that humility? Uh, obviously, if you're going around saying I'm very humble, 
Yes, very humble. <laughs> Not worth that way. So how would we see that you're humble? What, what's that going to look like? The next two verses are going to help us with that. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll look at verses 1 through 3. And can I get a volunteer to read that when you get there? Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Yes, said one. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Thank you. So lowliness, meekness, these are meekness is a near synonym, lowliness is a synonym for humility. Okay, hold, your, hold that thought in mind. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5. 1 Peter 5 and verse 5. This one says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. But God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. So what is this going to look like? What is evidence of a, a deep and sincere humility in a person's life, in a Christian's life? Yes, Matt. One word could be said is submission, but I mean yeah. more, more than that even just... Um, uh, putting each, putting others, Paul said, uh, above, above ourselves. Right, considering others before ourselves. Let, let me go back to that word submission, then we'll come to Roger's suggestion. Submission simply means when somebody comes to me, or somebody comes to you, and they've got a problem, you've offended them. If I'm humble, and I'm submitted to my brothers, as it says here, or my sisters, I'm going to listen, aren't I? I'm going to consider what they have to say. I'm going to be kind. I'm not going to say, that's the stupidest. You're just offended because you don't like me. Just go away. That's not humility. Yeah, good. Roger, you had something else, another uh, evidence of humility. You're not proud. You're not always looking to be center stage. Right. Mm -hmm. Don't need to be in the limelight. Don't need recognition. Right? Go back to Ephesians chapter 4 and, and verses 1 through 3. See if there's a word you see there that's going to be an evidence in a, in a body of believers, in a church, a word that's going to be evidence of this spirit of humility that we are, we're fostering, we're seeking at Elmira Baptist Church. I'm sure other churches are seeking it as well. But what's going to be a, a hallmark or a trait of a church that's seeking humility like this? Humility. Yes, Patty. Unity. 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 Proverbs tells us, Proverbs 13, 20, only by pride cometh contention. So if I look over a, a group of believers and there's a lot of fighting, mm -hmm. a lot of people angry at each other, pastor, you can't believe what he said to me, or you wouldn't believe what she did to me. This is, I, I'm going to get that person back. Oh, what? Well, stop. There's a lack of humility. Mm -hmm. There's a pride that causes this tension. This is true in your family, too. I know it's true in my family. When do I get mad and frustrated with my kids? When I feel like, hey, I'm the dad. They're not treating me right. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, as a father, I'm, I'm tasked mm -hmm. by God with teaching my children respect for parents. So I'm not saying I, I don't care how they treat me. But if my issue is they're not treating me right, I'm the father. I, I deserve this. Mm -hmm. That's a lack of humility. Now, I still need to deal with disrespect. But not out of this spirit of frustration and anger, because they're not treating me the way I deserve to be treated. Mm -hmm. So humility, submission, um, unity, those are some other words. Last chance to get into evidence before we go on to number three here. Okay, let's go on to number three. Luke 9, 23. Luke 9, 23. Probably many of you could quote this verse. We'll get there and say, oh yeah, I knew that one. Luke 9.23. Yes, Roger, would you read that for us? And he said to the Paul, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and 
Yes, that's what that verse says. Just a few pages over, you'll find Luke 14, 33. And this gives us the word that I'm looking for in the first blank, which goes along with the thought from Luke 9, 23. Matt, can I get you to read uh, Luke 14, 33? Uh, Matt Cook. Okay. Sorry, I'm, yeah. <laughs> couple of mats here. 1433. Yes. Uh, so likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Okay. So what word do you think goes in that first blank? Warren? Warren? I was going to say, where was it? Oh, it disappeared. Uh-oh. Trouble. What word goes in that blank? You have the blank in front of you. You don't need to look at this to see it, so. What did, did you say something, Matt? Forsaketh. Forsaketh, okay, but there's a better word than forsaketh that I think we should put in that first blank. Somebody's saying it, but they're saying, what? <laughs> dedication. Dedication. Yes, dedication is a good word. Let's use a different D word. Let's use discipleship there. And then I'm going to give you the other blank. So discipleship, commitment, another word we use, focus. Let's call this intentional biblical living. Intentional biblical living. It's not haphazard. Well, I, I mean, I don't know what I'm going to do with my week. No, I'm going to look at God's word, and I'm going to let that direct how I spend my money, how I raise my children, how I spend my time, what I think about, uh, how I treat people. We, we mentioned that earlier how I respond to folks in the church, all of that's going to be driven, going to be directed by what the Bible says. I'm going to be intentional. I'm going to look at my life and make sure it lines up with what God's Word says. That's what discipleship is. We do. We forsake other things. That's where focus comes in. You forsake other things in order to be intentional in your biblical living. Here's a concern that I have for our church. I've seen this in uh, other churches in our area. People go to church, don't they? They sing on Sunday, but then Monday through Saturday, they live just like everyone else. The Bible is not informing what they do. Now, are they Christians? They could be. I don't know people's hearts. But they're not disciples. Because a disciple denies himself takes up his cross and follows Jesus. He forsakes all in, in an effort to be a disciple. Um, let's go over to 1 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> this word does not have disciple in it, but it has intentional Christian living. So let's take a look at that one. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. First Peter 1 Peter 1.14 says, As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass this time of your sojourning here in fear. Mm -hmm. So he's calling for a, a focus and intentionality about what we're doing and how we're living. Not just floating through life and saying, oh, what are those guys doing? Yeah, I, that looks fun to me. No, we look at the Bible and say, what does the Bible say? That's the way I'm going to direct my life. Now, is that easy? No. I wish it was easier. But we have to be intentional about it. We have to be focused. You're not a disciple on accident. Nobody is a disciple because, well, it just sort of happened to me. It's because you make a decision, I'm going to forsake everything else, and I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. That's what I want for all of you here at Elmira Baptist Church. What's that going to look like? What's going to be evidence of that in our lives? This one might be a little bit vague, a little bit harder to think through, but let's let's give it give it a shot. What do you think are some evidences if a person is a disciple, they're committed, they're focused, they're intentionally living biblically? 
don't just list commands. There are a lot of commands, but let's see if we can get a, a broader um, idea of what the evidence will be that they are disciples of Jesus Christ. Yes, Kurt. They uh, go and tell the people about Christ. Yes. They're absolutely convinced mm -hmm. that Jesus Christ is the answer. So when they see problems, when they meet people on the street, they know what their need is. Ultimately, Jesus Christ. Even if you don't know anything about that person. If they're not a Christian, they need Jesus Christ. And if they are a Christian, they need Jesus Christ. You can just tell anyone about Jesus Christ. Right. And every once in a while, you meet someone who's ex who is as excited about talking about Jesus Christ as you are. Mm -hmm. And aren't those blessed conversations? Yeah. So, yeah, you don't need to find people. I mean, whoever you meet, if you're a disciple, you're going to want to tell them about Jesus Christ. Roger. Your language. Yeah, your language. And we mentioned that back when we talked about loving God. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come out in, you're not going to take the Lord's name in vain, that's for sure, right? You're not going to curse people, call them vulgar names. Um, yes, excellent. Yes, Roger. Right. When you come up to somebody and their language is bad, you automatically know they're, they're, they're lost. Just because the spirit of them comes out in their language. Yeah. So yeah. Christians generally um, talk better than, you know, when I was a lost person and I didn't know any better. I talked pretty bad when I was in the Air Force. I talked pretty bad. But now that I'm a Christian, when I meet people, somehow I know that they're Christians. And because, I don't know, there's like this, oh, I seem to know this person. He feels right. <laughs> but the Bible says that our spirit will perceive their spirit. Yeah, it does say that. Yeah. yeah. And it's true. Somehow you run up to people and all of a sudden you're having a conversation. And you're nice and friendly with them. And then you realize that they must be one of us. Right. Right. That, that happens to me frequently. Right. Yeah. It's a yeah. blessing. It is a blessing. It's your language. Yeah. The minute a lost person comes up and that blah, blah, blah comes out of their mouth, I go, oh man, I know this person. Right. I mean, what do you mean? Right. What do you mean? So. Right. I was talking with a neighbor the other day and he started using language I'm not going to repeat here. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> he needs salvation, doesn't he? Right. I mean, yeah. uh, he wouldn't talk this way if he believed Jesus Christ was the Son of God, right. died for his sins, rose again. He, right. he just wouldn't talk that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, Patty. Yes, thank you. That's a good one. How they handle hardship. How is a disciple, how is a person who's committed, who's focused, who's intentionally living biblically, how is that person going to respond to hardship, Patty? They're going to respond to it by obeying God. Mm -hmm. Obedience, yep. They're going to seek his face. Right. They're going to be praying. They're going to be going to the Lord. Yep. Trust that he is sovereign in the situation. Yes. And that he has a purpose for yes. it. They're going to allow him to conform them to the image of his yes, son. Yes, that's an important one, yeah. And stay under that pressure without right. running away. <laughs> <laughs> we want to run away, but right, they are. Yeah. They're going to dig into the word of God yes. to find the encouragement that they need there. Right. They're going to seek counsel mm -hmm. from people they know love God. Right. They maybe mm -hmm. see things they don't. Sure. So there's six things under pressure that a disciple is going to do yeah. that the average person's not going to do. Right. Yeah, I have a few extra minutes. This is why, by the way, the pandemic has been so hard for most Americans. Yes. Because when you put people under pressure that have no hope in Jesus Christ, yeah. you've, you've got to find other answers. Science or medicine or, you know, you wearing a mask for their sake, whatever. They're, they're, that's what, that's the only response they have. I was reading an article just today um, basically, these people, they're, they're so worried now because we're, we're lifting these mandates. Mm -hmm. And they could die. Yeah. Well, that's true. I suppose they could cross the street and get killed too. I mean, there's a lot of things they could die from. And when you don't have Jesus Christ, that type of pressure, really it really plays with your mind. But as a Christian, as a disciple, even more than just as a Christian, as a disciple, we have hope. And yes, I may die too. I may die driving home today. But the difference is I know where I'm going to go. I know God will have a purpose in that in my family's life, in your life, that a person who's not a Christian and not, or a Christian and not a disciple doesn't have. So that, thank you for bringing that out, Patty. That's, that's an excellent uh, evidence of discipleship really comes out when you're put under pressure. Matt? I, I would just say, having been in a lot of churches in the past two years, yeah. um, one of the things we've seen, as, uh, and I, and I 
partly say seeing, uh, talking with the pastors and, and about them and their church and what they've experienced over mm-hmm. the last two years is that they've said that this pressure that's been placed has, I don't want to say it, people that aren't in church anymore aren't Christian, weren't Christians, but right. it, it really divided the churches between who was really serious and who wasn't. Some mm-hmm. really thought, look, I need to be in church more. i got to figure this out. I don't yeah. know what else to do. And some people just said, well, I can't handle this. Right. And went away. I'm done. Yeah. 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 The Bible talks about it like, um, there it goes away again, like dross out of metal. You heat metal mm-hmm. up, and the waste that's not metal comes to the top. You knock that off, and you're left with a more pure mm-hmm. metal than you had before. But it takes heat, mm-hmm. a lot of heat. I don't know about you. I don't like heat. Yeah. So I would like to keep my dross. God says, no, no, i got a better plan for you than yeah. that. So, yeah. yeah, don't be afraid of trouble. It's God molding us into the image of Jesus Christ. All right, let's look at Psalm uh, 18 and Psalm 63. Let's do it this way. Um, AJ, would you find Psalm 18 and uh, prepare to read verses 1 and 2? And then, um, Warren, would you find Psalm 63 and prepare to read verses 1 and 2? And then we're looking for... For a blank, daily direct response to a personal, and then that's the word we're looking for. AJ, when you're ready, would you read Psalm 18, verses 1 and 2? Sure. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. Thank you. Warren, Psalm 63, 1 and 2. Oh God. soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory, mm. so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Notice in both of these passages, the psalmist is speaking directly to whom? God. And what does he say to the Lord? He says, you are my God. In both of these mm. at one point, you are my God. Mm. So, who is that personal direct response to? What goes in that blank? God. God. Yeah. Um, I have no problem when uh, sometimes from time to time one of you will come to me and you'll say, so-and-so is a great podcast. It's a real encouragement to me. I'm listening to it. Or you'll say, so-and-so is a great preacher. I've been listening to sermons by him. No problem there. But we're not called to respond to men or women, to people. We're called to respond directly to God. Mm -hmm. So don't let a person come between you and God. You young people, think about this. Often we let our parents come between Mm -hmm. us and God. Because, I mean, we've got good parents and they love God. And so we sort of just ride their coattails. Feel like At some point, young people, you've got to say, as the psalmist said, Oh God, oh Lord, you are my God. I remember when it happened for me. I'm guessing all of you who had that same personal and direct response to God remember a time when you didn't have a response to God like that. You weren't even a Christian. And at some point, boom, you realized, oh, Lord, you are my God. It's got to be a personal and direct response to him uh, that we're looking for. Let me give you a a couple of... uh, Evidences here because I, I want to take this in a particular direction. So if I have a personal and direct response to the Lord as my God, I'm not going to be as focused on the rules as I'm going to be focused on my relationship with him. Amen. Now, what I don't mean by that is it doesn't matter what I do, because we already looked at the fact that if I love God, I obey him. But let me give you this example. Let's imagine your child's playing in the house and they knock over the, your favorite vase and it shatters on the floor. Now, obviously, if, if it's my house, my children are not supposed to be playing in such a way they're knocking things off the table, right? So there's a problem. We've got to deal with the problem. But I can deal with it one of two ways. I can just get angry and, how stupid are you? I can't believe you knocked that face. You knew that face was there. You were so careless. And I, and I can respond that way. Or I can respond with, okay, that wasn't your face to break. 
you understood, you knew ahead of time what the rules were for this house. You can't be playing baseball or my brothers and I play basketball with those little Nerf balls and the, you know, mm-hmm. put holes in the wall and put maps <laughs> over the holes so my dad didn't know about it. Um, we, we knew what the rules were. We knew what we were not supposed to be doing in the house. We just didn't care. Right. So there needs to be discipline. There needs to be rebuke of those children. But how you handle it, is it a focus on you've made me mad, I don't like you, or is it a focus on this is what's right, this is what's wrong? Right. You've got to do what's right. So when I say we're not focused on the rules, what I mean by that is I don't, as I'm personally making choices for my life, my focus isn't on do I get brownie points for doing this or do I get docked by God for doing that? My focus is on I love God, I want to make him happy. So there's some things that I don't do because that doesn't make God happy. And there's some things I'm going to do because that makes God happy. An obvious one, just one that I hope we're all doing, time with prayer in God each day. It's not so I can check it off my list. I'm not writing home to my parents and saying, hey, look how much time I spent with God this morning. It's because I genuinely love God and I enjoy my times of prayer. Now, there are some mornings where that time of prayer takes me five or ten minutes to to get some traction, but boy, I'm so glad I make myself stop and pray because I love God and I want that relationship with him. It's not a matter of the rules as in this list. It's a matter of my relationship. Uh, Turn to Hebrews with me. Hebrews 13, 9. I want to show you what this scripture says in relation to this focus on our relationship rather than a focus on the rules. Hebrews 13, 9. Hebrews 13, 9, be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. So look at that phrase, not with meats. Let's start with the negative here. What would it mean to try to establish my heart with meats? And again, he's writing to Hebrews. He's, right. That's the book, Hebrews, to Jews. What are Jews thinking about when they're thinking about meats? I'm going to pick on Matt in the back. Matt, what is a Jew thinking about? He thinks about meats. What is he thinking about? Offerings. Yeah, offerings, right? So there's this list of, I'm reading through Leviticus in my time with God right now, and there's this long list of what type of offerings to bring, how much, when, what. Okay, so there's this list of rules. Yeah, about offerings. What else might a Jew think about when he thinks about meats? Yes, Kurt. Pork. Yeah, pork. There's a there's a list of prohibited meats, things he can't eat. That's also Leviticus. And you remember when Peter saw the yeah. sheet let down from heaven, and he heard a voice, "Kill and eat." He said, "No, no, I, I can't eat this stuff." Now, again, I'm not saying what we do doesn't matter. It matters a lot, but it's the attitude. Is my focus on the list of the rules, or is my focus on God's grace? I know when I focus on the rules, here's my problem. I try to do it in my own strength. Oh, I can do this. I'm I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to watch that movie. I know that's bad. I'm I'm not going to watch that. I can do that in my own strength. And I'm not going to yell at my kids because I know that's bad. Okay, I can do that in my own strength. The problem is, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Right. What I focus on is I say, God, you've given me grace to say no to this. Yes. You've given me grace to say yes to this. And that's what I want all of us to understand. It's not just the rules. It's a relationship with God. Now, the relationship with God will lead me to do what, God, what pleases him. But it's not, the relation, it's not the rules. It's a relationship. And second, and I've already mentioned this one, don't let a person come between you and your relationship with God. I am glad to pray for you and to pray specifically for things that are on your heart. But I want to pray with you. Mm -hmm. I don't want to pray so that you don't pray. I don't have a special, I was going to think of a landline. We don't use landlines anymore. But I don't have a special phone to God in my office that you don't have. Yes, we do, but I don't. I don't have a special landline to God in my office that you don't have. You have the same access to God as I do. We call that the priesthood of the believers. And you remember when Jesus died, 
that that temple veil ripped mm -hmm. from the top down to the bottom to signify that access before the people didn't have access to God. They had to go through the priests. But now we have access to God. We are the priests, the Bible says. So again, if you come to me with a prayer request, I, I write it down, I'm going to pray for it. But you've got to pray for it too. It's not that you come to me because, oh, well, pastor, he gets his prayers answered and I never do. If you're not getting your prayers answered, you talk to God about that. He cares. It's a lot of prayers I don't get answered. No. Okay, so uh, number one, we're not going to focus on the relationship, on the rules. We're going to focus on the relationship with God. We're not going to be worried about what the list is. We're going to worry, be worried about God's grace. We're going to be concerned with how, what God's grace enables me to do and enables me not to do. We're not going to rejoice in judgment. We're going to rejoice in mercy. This comes out, too, in our humility with other people. When, other, when we catch a fellow brother or a fellow sister in sin, are we going to be excited? Oh, man, I'm going to go tell pastor. No. I'm going to be concerned. Here's a person that they're hurting. God's going to give them grace. He can forgive them, and he can move them on. This morning, somebody wrote to me... Um, yeah. This morning somebody wrote to me and he was in his personal reading with God, came across a, a chapter, I'm trying to remember which one it was, in Psalms, a Psalm, Psalm 16, Psalm 17. He said, it just spoke to my heart. It was like God said, I forgive you. Mm. Yes. Amen. That's what we want to understand. That's right. God forgives. So we want to rejoice in that mercy rather than in judgment. All right, we're going to finish up with these others uh, on this other side. Uh, on the back side next week, uh, 5, 6, 7, and 8. If you want to get a head start, you can look at those verses and uh, take a chance to read those at home.